Well, hello, and thank you so much for joining us to another for another online service here at Agoro Bio Fellowship. We're so thankful that you have clicked that link and you get to spend some time in God's Word with us. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here at ABF, and I just have a few things to bring to your attention before we get into God's Word. The first thing is, uh, if you have any prayer requests, we love praying for you every single week. We talk about that every single week, and we really do mean it. Uh, we love uh, partnering with you in prayer. So if there are I- if there are any prayer requests you might have, you can text those to 97,000, 97,000, and I promise you that they're confidential, and uh, we, we get them, and we pray for you throughout the week, so please don't hesitate to do that. Uh, the second thing is that we always have just a, a lot of energy, a lot of things happening here at our church, at Agora Bible, and uh, the best place to find what's going on in our student ministries, our children's ministries, our young adults, and men's and women's, and, and, and our seniors is, is our website. So you can go to our website at agorabible.org and you can see our schedule of events and and any information for any of those ministries and and you can reach out to us and we would love to make sure that you have all the information needed for any of those events coming up. So that's a great place to check out. Uh, Also, we just... Man, we're just so thankful for your ongoing generosity. The, there's no way that we could be doing the ministries that we do and, and what we put on uh, on Sunday, uh, this service, even for you, uh, without your generosity. So we're so thankful uh, for your donations, your tithes, and your gifts. And we just uh, hope that you consider uh, donating uh, to Agora Bible, and you can do that in two ways. One, you can go to agorabible.org, and under the Give tab, you can make a donation, or you can download our Church Center app and scroll down and find Agora Bible, and you can do it that way. Uh, but again, we're just so thankful that you're spending some time with us, and now let's get into God's Word. Well, thanks, Chris, and greetings, online church family. Good to be with you again as we're working our way through the book of 2 Corinthians. And uh, we're probably going to go a couple weeks after Easter and then pause in 2 Corinthians and pick back up in the fall with a few different uh, additional series, one in the spring, a new summer series, excited about that. But uh, as we continue... Uh, working through the text, there's just so many valuable lessons, and uh, this one has some really strong teaching on kind of picking up where we left off last week, just on having an eternal mindset, having uh, a, a glimpse of the future allows us to kind of uh, run everything from our current situations through that uh, lens. Stumbled on an article this uh, past week that went through, a uh, recent one from, the, uh, from Forbes magazine that went through some of the things that high achieving people are not afraid of. Thought some of these are helpful, some not as much, but some of the things that high achieving people are not afraid of, one being discomfort, they're not, uh, they're okay with that, they're okay with, I thought the second one was interesting, tolerating feelings others suppress. So they're okay with uh, working through feelings and emotions. They're okay or not afraid of unexpected changes, not afraid of being corrected. They're not concerned with being disliked. They realize that that's a, uh, a, a pursuit that's somewhat impossible. Not being disliked, not having an extended plan. I thought that was interested, not concerned with that. Being criticized or misunderstood uh, aligns similarly to the being disliked. Uh, They're also not concerned or afraid of uh, apologizing when they're wrong. Also on the other side of that, admitting when they don't know something. I think that's important for sure in life. Uh, They also want to, uh, they're more committed to striving for progress rather than perfection. They're realistic with that, realizing we're just trying to move forward. You can see some benefits in that even in the Christian life. Additional things that they had on that list is that they uh, were willing to admit, oh, I already said that one, admit when they don't know something. But the other one is that they're uh, willing to ignore the opinions of people they didn't want to switch places with. I thought that was interesting. You could probably make a case uh, for or against that idea. They're also okay with letting things go that aren't working. They're not digging in their heels. They're willing to be like, hey, that's not working. Uh, Let's move on. When similar in the last thing on the list was also they're willing and uh, not afraid to fail. 
So all of these things are part of the mindset of uh, somebody that's uh, achieving in life, kind of a, a humanistic to some degree article, but I think some merit found in some of those. But what I found interesting, what was missing on the list, there was no mention of the person not being afraid of death. Something that every single one of us faces, something that every single one of us has on the calendar at some point on the horizon. That's not something they're absent of fear of. In fact, so many people operate with a, with a, a fear and, and, and just a trepidation about death. And I find it interesting in Scripture, Paul is able to offer something in this text that Forbes can't touch, can't make an offer to, but he's willing to offer something to us. And really the offer is for us to have confidence when we're facing death. You see, that's something that Paul had to have because really he was always just spending his life right on the brink of that risk, whether it was from the, uh, the hands of an uh, of a unbelieving Jew, whether it was a Gentile that saw him as an obstacle or a, or a threat, he always had the risk of death. In fact, much of the later in this book, in the chapter 11, he spends time talking about some of the pain that he's endured because of that beatings that have brought him to the uh, brink of death. And ultimately, we know that Paul eventually had uh, his head, uh, he was beheaded as his death. And so really, he's trying to have a mindset that allows him to persevere amidst all of that. And where many people, you would have told, you would have said, hey, knowing that there's this level of response and emotion to the message that you're proclaiming, maybe you should ease up a little bit. Well, that's not exactly what Paul was known for. The threat seemed to amplify, and so did his courage for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. All of that, all of that he was capable of because he had what Josh talked about last week, an eternal mindset. He saw above and beyond. He saw that the, the temporary uh, discomforts, the, uh, the temporary obstacles that we deal with pale in comparison to the reward that's on the other side of this life for those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And so we're going to explore even more of that topic here as we work through chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. Let me pray before we do that. Lord Jesus, we thank you again for this opportunity to, to gleam insight into life that otherwise our world seems to miss. We get so encapsulated with the here and now and, and trying to protect something that's really not something we can protect. But when we have the mindset of Paul, when we see past the horizon to what's on the other side, it really changes the lens in which we see the circumstances that we're going through. We, I ask that you would teach us through this text, that you'd mold us and shape us to have an eternal mindset, even with tough subjects such as our perishing. I just invite that in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So starting in chapter 5, I'll read the first uh, few verses and just break it down. It's got a lot packed in here. It says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on the heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may, uh, may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. All right, let's explain what's happening here. First, it starts, he's reinforcing something that he's explaining that they already know. It says, for we know. But has this really sunk in? What is it that he's wanting to sink in that is uh, based in their, their, the really core of who they are? What he's explaining, he says there, we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, this tent that he's referring to, he's using as a, a metaphor for, for our human body. 
Paul, being a tent maker, would know a little something about tents and how temporary they are and know how many shortcomings they have, basically each one of them being on a timeline made out of material similar for us as he's referring to our bodies, realizing that, man, we're not getting any younger. I don't know how, what stage you're at at life or how you view getting older when you're young. It's something that you're looking forward to. You're like, oh, well, I can't wait to be done with school or I, I can't wait to, uh, to start my first job or to get married or to have kids or to get my first house or to get established in my career. All of these things are further out and you uh, see life with more of an anticipation. And then I don't know when that happens, but at some point you wake up and you're like, wait a second, I'm old. I've gotten there. There's a, there's a, a shift in your thinking and your mindset is less about what's to come and trying to think through, man, I have very limited time here. I'm racing towards eternity. And that's where we see here that mentality and that understanding for that to sink in for us to realize that this is all temporary. This is temporary. This is fleeting. This is passing. John MacArthur describes death, I like this, as an unsympathetic landlord waving his eviction notice. You got to get out of this tent. Waving the eviction notice that it's coming. At some point, you're going to be done. You can't stay in it forever. But here's the problem. Some of us have gotten really comfortable in this tent. Some of us, really, if we're honest, don't want to leave. We don't want to move out. I don't know how many of us in our audience are known for being campers. I wouldn't say that that's somebody that, something that I necessarily love to do. I like the idea of a clean shower, go out, mess around all day, get as dirty as I want, but then coming back to that clean room and shower. But for those of you that do camp, and I have done some camping, enough to know something about it, there's different types of people as it relates to camping. Some people love just throwing out a, a tent on the bare ground and they're sleeping out in the, or even sleeping in a sleeping bag out in the uh, open sky. That, that's one version of, of camping. But then there's the other version of camping, and I think they actually have a term for it called glamping, which is kind of glamorous camping. They like some of the creature comforts of this world. They like the, the padded bed or, or really the people that have taken it to the next level. You show up at a camping location and they are pulling up their million dollar RV that has every possible amenity in it. Those people, those people have the mindset, man, I'm not in too much of a hurry to get out of this place. I can stick around and it's no big deal. Well, I suggest that spiritually speaking, we can also have a glamping mindset to our experience here, in our, in, here on this planet. There should be a level of discomfort. There should be a level of groaning as it describes here in the text. I don't know if you're at the stage of life where that starts to be more and more part of it. You see, as time passes, it doesn't matter how much you like your tent. It doesn't matter how much you like your circumstances. All of a sudden, you realize, wait a second, this tent is for sure breaking down. The groaning piece, the longing for more, the longing for different, you start to realize, man, this isn't working like it used to. And that groan might be a little weird noise as you're making your way out of bed in the morning or when you're bending over to pick up something off the floor. Either way, we're all breaking down. Whether we want to, whether we, not, whether we don't, whether we're resisting it, resisting it, death rate is still at 100%. But the good news, and that's what I'm getting to here in the text, the good news that Paul is pointing to that allows him to approach his life with certainty and confidence and boldness is what's presented here in the text. We have for the, we're, the tent is finishing up, but he says we have, and he's talking, when he's saying we, he's talking to believers here, those who have committed their lives to Jesus Christ. We have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Sounds pretty epic to me is that description. Basically for the believer, the eviction notice is from a tent to a house. 
kind of a, a cool idea, a, a solid foundation of moving from something that's temporal into something that's eternal. That's the amazing hope that Paul clung to, and he's hoping his audience reading that still clings to today. Imagine that. I'm getting to trade in my tent for something permanent. We have for years had the opportunity to partner with Hugo Ministries and going down on these house building trips to Mexico. And one of the things that we do kind of as part of the pattern is we build the homes in the course of the week. This year we're on schedule to do that in the month of June. And in that month, and when we're there for that week, we have the opportunity at the end once it's completed. It's one of my favorite experiences is to hand the keys of this newly built home to a struggling couple or family that have literally never had a home of their own. Just the, the joy of that, the exuberance as they're saying, wait a second, I, I'm breaking out of the chains of poverty even in these moments. And that's the same exact principle that Paul's trying to reiterate. Listen, you're going to be done with this tent. There's something better on the other side. Don't get too comfortable here. He explained something that for at first read to me was didn't make a, a lot of sense when he's explaining, not that we would be unclothed. I don't know why he refers to being clothed and naked and unclothed. Basically, he's in that time period. He's addressing kind of a popular cultural, Greek cultural suggestion that we're trying to be set free from our bodies so that we can experience spiritual nirvana. So in other words, the material world is, is bad and the spiritual world is good and we want to, as fast as possible, be done with the physical world. Well, to some degree, there's some accuracy there, but what Paul's explaining, hey, you're not going to be done with the physical body. You're just exchanging one for a better one, for an eternal one. We're still looking forward to the freedom that comes with that, not because of a disembodied spirit, but he's saying, I'm giving you a new body, a spiritual body that will still be able to be aware, that you'll still be able to worship, that you'll still be present in heavenly places, that you'll still be able to serve and adore our God. That, my friends, is what's on the horizon when we're being swallowed up, this current body swallowed up and replaced with the eternal, with true life. Let's continue in this text, seeing it as it was intended, I believe, as encouragement. It says, He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. What's he saying here? Basically, when he's referred to prepared us for this very thing, this is basically unfolding exactly in accordance with God's will. This is God's design. He's put it in place, this entire system. He made choices prior. He put things in place with creation. And this is unfolding. There's no accidents here. There's no, oh my, what's going on here? God's perfect plan is playing itself out. And here's the thing that he explains as part of this. He says, for, the, for this very thing is God who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. What spirit is he talking about? He's talking about the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, part of the Trinity that's given to every single believer at the point of salvation. That is a gift to us. And it's also cool to think of it as a, a guarantee. I've bought and sold enough cars over the years to understand kind of how a deposit works. Basically, it's something that was given uh, in exchange. Hey, you're going to have access to this car, but you need to leave something of value as a guarantee, something to tell or confirm that you're serious, that you're not going to walk away from this purchase commitment. I like that picture that we see in scripture there. It was something that was present in that culture as well, that there's something given as a, as a guarantee. And so the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is really a guarantee that the Lord isn't going to walk away from those who he's placed a guarantee in. He's not going to walk away. It'd be, it's, it's almost insane to think he's going to walk away from himself, his own spirit, that's the security and the confidence that we have for those who are genuinely in Christ. 
There's another way to see that word guarantee as well in Scripture. Basically, you can see it as a, like a deposit, but you can also see it as a preview of what's to come. A guarantee, kind of like a, you'd see in the movie theater, uh, a, a quick uh, snapshot of what's coming up, a preview or a trailer is the term that we often uh, use of, of what to anticipate. I remember when the movie Top Gun, after so many years of production, many years back, and then the new one was coming out a few years back and seeing the preview and you got the music going, you got the planes going, like man, there was something about that that stirred up some energy to see what was coming next. Similar for us, Paul, as he's writing his audience, he's stirring the pot to say, man, this is a, a preview. This is a guarantee, something every single one of us should be looking forward to that God himself has put in place. Because of that, there's an appropriate response we see in verse 6. So, in other words, because of this, we are always of good courage we know that while we are here, while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. So again, because of this truth, what truth is this? The, the truth that he just talked about, that we're exchanging this tent for a new permanent home, that we've been given the Holy Spirit as a, a preview or a down payment. So because of that, he's telling us we're always of good courage or of good cheer or basically uh, the, the picture there is a, a positive outlook on things. And here's the question for us with that understanding, if that's not a description of us, if not, then why not? Man, that, 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 that tells us if it's not a description of us, that some of these truths about our eternity and what's to come haven't really sunk in. That's why just a couple of weeks ago when I was teaching, I was talking about, man, there should be a skip to our step. There should be a, a, a glow to our, uh, our, our person because of these realities. He explains a little bit of something here. He says, we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Now, first I was like, man, what is, what is that explaining? We're home in our body, so basically describing our existence here on earth. We're away from the Lord. You're like, but the Lord's present with us. But as we see in scripture elsewhere, right now we see through a glass dimly. We see, we get a taste of it, but we don't experience all that's on the horizon. Believers communicate with the Lord through prayer and study of the word and commune with him through the Holy Spirit, but there's still a sense that there's still a separation, that there's a gap between us and what's coming. We get tastes of it, but there's still something similar to a, a longing that we have, a, a prisoner that's longing for freedom, whether it's a, a poor man that's longing for a payday, whether it's a, somebody that's sick that's uh, just longing for uh, healing. That's the picture of we're intended to have as we think through the kingdom of heaven. And in the meantime, as we're waiting for that, as, the, as we're in this kind of holding zone, what does he tell us? He says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. It's a statement that we see re here reiterated so often. And really, that's a summary of the Christian life. That so much of the Christian life is spent, you know what? We can't see it. We can't touch it. We can't feel it. We get glimpses of it. But in the meantime, while we're waiting, we just have to continue walking by faith. But our faith over time should be amplified. It should be increasing. I know personally, even in my own spiritual life, that the longer I'm walking with the Lord, the more I'm confident in the Lord. It's kind of from experience, from, from having time uh, past that you're, you've experienced his goodness, you've experienced his grace, you've experienced his provision. All of those things are part of walking by faith and not by sight. Some of it, though, he's kind enough to give us glimpses of our trust being rooted and grounded in the right thing. So the appropriate response should be a, a good courage, should be walking by faith, should be a confidence. Continue in the text. These last couple of verses, we'll end with verse 10. It says, yes, we are of good courage. 
And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we're at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. All right, we'll stop there for today, but that's a, a lot to cover just walking through those couple verses. He's ending the section here. Kind of what you describe as kind of a, a triumphant declaration. Notice this time when he says, we are of good courage. This, this, the second time repeating that, it's not something that, uh, something we're aspiring to. Man, that should be something that's a mark of everyone who's genuinely walking with the Lord. It's something, not something we aspire to, but something we get to experience. Then he explains even what I already mentioned. He says that you would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Basically preferring to be done with this tent and present with the, this Lord, uh, with, our, with our Lord. That's part of the natural experience. That should be for those of us that genuinely know the Lord. There should be more and more as we get glimpses and tastes of him. There should be a, a longing to be present with him. We shouldn't be settling for the meager experiences that we're having here on this earth. That's not what we were created for. That's not what we were meant for. Remember some years back, my uh, son, on his birthday, we decided to surprise him by getting a, him a bike of his own. I remember going and uh, obviously with a, a limited budget. And so we headed over to Walmart. And because I had looked at all the prices, of the bikes that they had uh, for sale there, I was like, all right, buddy, you can pick out whichever bike you want here. And uh, man, he was, he was jazzed. He's going down, kind of checking out all the different features of the different bikes they had for sale, whether it was a mountain bike or a trick bike. Well, he picked out this really cool all black one. And uh, I remember a couple days later hearing him talk to one of the neighbor kids and he's explaining to him, he's like, my dad let me pick out the very best bike at Walmart. I was just kind of chuckling in the back of my mind because I'm a little older and know a little bit more that uh, that's not the pinnacle of bikes. That's kind of uh, anything at, at Walmart. I'd be kind of a, more on the, the starter range of anybody that's actually into cycling of any sort. It's kind of the, the same idea that our God must have dealing with us, settling for Walmart experiences. We're like, oh yeah, I love my, my experience here on, on earth, my car, my house, my, my, uh, my social network, my, my job, the prestige I have here. He must just be chuckling in the background. He's like, oh, my child, my child, you're settling for Walmart experiences when there's so much more in store. There's so much better. We were created for so much more than this. Don't get too caught up with Walmart thinking is the idea here. We should have the mindset of, man, I, I'm here. Uh, I, I'm here with a purpose. I, I, I'm here with a calling and a mission. But man, I'm not attached to the things here on earth. That's not what our existence revolves around. But because of that amazing hope that we do have, what do you see in the text that we're called to do? What is it his charge for us in response to that amazing hope? It says, we make it our aim to please him. We make it our aim to please him. Basically, our longing for heaven shouldn't cause us to live irresponsibly or indifferent. It should cause us as an overflow, as a natural progression that, man, because of this, man, I want my life to circle around, to orbit around him and what pleases him. My question for us, even as we consider this message, is what are you, are, are you living with that mentality? Do you start your day? Is your mindset, okay, well, how is this? Is this going to be something that's pleasing to him? Something that's not pleasing to him? Is this something that aligns with what he's directed me? It's interesting, sometimes people would read a section like this where they might say like, well, I don't really necessarily always know what pleases God. I don't know how he's just this, uh, this uh, out, out, of the, out of the picture character, and I don't really know what would actually make him happy. And it's pretty awesome that scripture actually makes it, it boils it down in a nutshell to some pretty clear description of what actually does uh, please him. 
Jesus, when he's talking to Philip in John chapter 14, verse 15, says this. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Basically, he's saying what it looks like to please him is to align your life within the confines, the parameters of what he's called us to. He's actually given us very clear instruction on what to do, what not to do, what to pursue, what not to pursue, keeping his commandments. And well, you might say, well, I don't know which commandments. Well, when he was asked, when Jesus was confronted by some Sadducees actually trying to trap him in his words, they asked him, well, which commandments? What is, what's the greatest commandment? I love his response because really, Really, this gives us clear direction on what we're intended to be focused on. When asked the greatest commandment, he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your uh, soul and with, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On this two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So what is he saying? The big idea. You're like, okay, if you love me, you're going to obey my commandments. Okay, well, then what are your commandments? Well, if he's going to boil it down to a nutshell, he's basically saying, love God, love people. Like, all right, that's, that, that's something a little bit more tangible. Well, let's take it a, a, a step further. The love God piece is something that is obviously expressed through, through worship, through the study of his word, through, uh, through as I said, obeying his commandments. So the loving people is the new piece in this equation. So what does loving people look like? How does that demonstrate it? Well, he gave us clear direction on that. It's kind of moving from the general to the more specific. The very last charge that Jesus gave his disciples before leaving is the exact same charge charge that he gives us in our lifetime. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So how do we make it our aim to please him, to stay on mission for us to be living with purpose, a plan, trying to rescue as many as possible. And really, is that such a chore to say, hey, I found hope for my eternity, hope for uh, this lifetime. Man, I want to just share it with those around us. That's the charge. How do we please him? I would suggest when you look at the whole of scripture, that should be a motivator. And look, if that's not enough motivator, even just the joy of being a part of that plan, look in verse 10. I'll repeat what that says here in our text. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, when you read this, you're just like, wait a second, stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You're just like, I thought if I'm a believer, the, pe the penalty for my sin has been paid. I've been set free. That is absolutely 100% true. The actual, that term, that expression here, judgment seat of Christ, it can be confusing because judgment is usually seen in a negative sense. But the word for this seat is actually described in the original language as the word is used bima, the bima seat, which was the same seat or podium that was described for those who had competed in the Olympic Games. You know how on the Olympics you'll see the different stands at different heights where they can kind of stand based on how they perform. And that's basically the wreath ceremony that we still duplicate in the games today is the same picture described there of a bima seat where you're putting the reward for one's actions, the, the wreath on or the uh, flowers or whatever. In our day and age, it's a, a gold, silver, or bronze medal. Basically, whatever it is, this is the, the picture that he's saying. We will stand and give an account for our ac actions. So once we have this eternal mindset, it's not like, oh, well, then I can just kind of write off the, our, our life here. Yes, there's going to be a point where we either give account for the things that we did that last, where we'll be rewarded, and basically describes good and evil here. Basically, the idea of evil, the word, could also be used for worthless. So basically, for the Christian life, for those of us with our eyes on eternity, that doesn't mean that we ignore 
the temporal. Doesn't mean that we ignore the, the rescue plan that he's encouraged us to be a part of here on this earth because it will be noted and it will be rewarded. And I was just thinking about that this week, how cool that is, that as if the purpose to get to be a part of redirecting somebody's eternity isn't enough as an overflow of response to all that God has done, that he's saying, you know, I've also put in a reward system. It's so funny how many businesses catch on to this idea. I'm somebody that loves a good Chipotle bowl like the rest of us, or I'm assuming the rest of us listening. And one of the things, I, I, don't, I don't need a lot of motivation to end my day or find my way to Chipotle, whether it's the, the taste of it, the, the chicken they get right, the steak they get right, even some of their crazy other meats they get right, fresh ingredients, taste good. But then they started adding this uh, reward thing that you can have on your phone that every time you order something, you get points towards something else. You do a big order with a larger group and you're like, man, I got a, a free burrito out of this. I got some chips and guac, like all of these things. I'm just like, you already had me at the burrito. You didn't have to throw in all of those things. And I know this is a really lame example as the connection, but I think that's a cool aspect of our God. Man, it should have been good enough just for us to say, man, I get to be a part of what God's doing here. But God's like, you know what? I've got a reward system in mind as well. So for us, it's healthy for us to be motivated by the fact that we will stand before this Bema seat. It's talked about, it's a repeated theme in scripture where we're gonna give an account for either our good works or our worthless deeds. I don't want to be a person that spends the majority of my life pursuing things that are worthless and aren't going to be rewarded for the person that has an eternal mindset that should be at the forefront of their mind. Well, I'm thankful through this text for the reminder uh, for us just having the mindset regardless of what experiences, uh, regardless how close we are to our final breath, to how far we are to our final breath, to have this hope that he points to, that this tent is going to be finished. We're going to be replaced with a, a perfect body, a perfect exist, existence, absent of pain, absent of suffering, absent of sin, and present with our Lord. That's something that should be a hope that every single one of us clings to. Let me pray in Jesus Christ's name. Lord Jesus, we call to you and just thank you for this opportunity because all of this is only possible through you. It's only through your name that we're rescued. It's only because of what you've done. And when you start laying out all the benefits that we have as a follower of Jesus Christ, you can see why the text points to us to uh, move forward with courage and in confidence, even of things that seem miserable in our current experience, just knowing of what's to come. God, we praise you for that reality. We're so undeserving. Why you choose to do all of this for us, we have no idea. But all we can do is bask in your goodness and just say thanks. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.